welcome back to the Toolkit for Traders YouTube channel where we give you the tools for trading success. And we're on to the ninth lesson of the Ecogerone EA's tutorial series. And this one is on the very exciting topic of loops and lists. Um, so ninth lesson, um, I had to bring this in one in um, together. There's a lot of content in here. Loops and lists can be quite uh, challenging. So I'm going to go through a lot at quite a quick speed, um, considering normally I go much slower than this. But, um, you know, it's on YouTube. You can watch this as many times as you like. And I do encourage you to give that a go. So in today's videos, we're going to go over loops and lists, which are a key part of programming. I didn't go through this in the basics. So I didn't want to uh, I didn't want to overcomplicate what we needed to do to get where we are now. But we're getting to the point where we need to start to use some loops and we need to be familiar with how lists are structured in MQL4. So we're going to look at what loops are. Um, we're going to look at some background on lists, which are also known as arrays. And we're going to um, code in MetaTrader a slightly better way to close our orders using one of the loop functions we talk about. So the quote for today's lesson is that perseverance is the hard work you do after you get tired of doing the hard work you already did. And that's Newt Gingrich. And uh, it, that's just really about the fact that you've got this far now. You worked hard to get this far. Don't give up at this stage. You will get there. Keep going. Keep putting in the hard work and we'll all get there. So the first thing we're going to look at today is uh, loops. So what are loops? So loops allow us to repeatedly execute the same section of code as many times as we want potentially infinitely. So in the same way uh, with functions, we can um, call a function and it will execute a certain piece of code. A loop will simply execute that code over and over again until um, we tell it to exit. Um, there are three kinds of loops in MQL4. You've got a while loop, a do while loop, and a for loop. We're gonna cover the main two types of loop um, here, which is while and for. If you wanna look at do while loops, after this, feel free to check it out in the MQL4 documentation. I'll put a link to that in the description below. Um, but we'll cover the main two, which is while and for, and you can pretty much do anything you need in MQL4 with those two. So looking at a while loop, so we're gonna look at a um, unrelated to trading example here. Um, we're gonna look at, we, we're gonna code in MQL4 a timer for a rocket countdown. Um, and we're going to use a while loop for that. So what we have here is we've got, we've named a variable. We've declared it's going to be an int called countdown timer. And as all good rocket countdowns do, they start on 10 and they count towards zero. We then use a while loop. So um, it's a special word here written in blue, um, which is how it will look in the, in the uh, editor. While and then open bracket. So similar to, this is written similar to how you do an if statement if you remember back a few lessons ago, we covered ifs. It's very, very similar to that, but we're using this special alert word, while. And here we say while, and we're saying while the countdown timer, that's this number here, is more than zero, we're going to do this. So what it will do is it will check it's going to go check this is not greater than zero. And obviously when it starts, it's 10, so that's going to be true. So in between here, this expression is true. So... It's going to execute this code. So it'll do this first line, which is going to do countdown timer is equal to countdown timer minus one. So we're going to reduce the countdown timer by one. So the next value is going to be uh, nine. Um, we're going to print uh, lift off in and we're going to print the countdown timer. So it's going to print the number nine. Um, then we are going to uh, wait for a second. So we're going to use an inbuilt function in MQL4, which is the sleep. So it's going to make the, the terminal sleep for a thousand milliseconds or one second. And then it's going to repeat that. And obviously in the next uh, um, round, uh, you know, we've got um, the countdown timer is still greater than zero. So it's going to go back through those three lines of code. And it's going to keep doing that until this line here reduces uh, that countdown timer to uh, be less than or to, to be zero or less and obviously when it gets to zero um, that will happen 
So you can see it's really crucial when you do loops to include this line. If you didn't include this line where you were changing um, a variable, you'd end up with an infinite loop that always is equal to true. And that's where you basically you freeze your computer program. So that's the big um, thing to watch out for uh, with loops. So when it finishes, it goes back to the start and redoes that code again until, until this expression um, evaluates to false and then it will it will just not do that anymore. And then obviously um, here we've added a bit of code to make our little program complete. So if the countdown time is zero, and obviously it will get there, we're going to print blast off. So we've got a nice little program and you could even code this in yourself into a little MQL4 file in a tick function and see if this works. Um, but it will. Um, only thing I've just noticed is it will start on nine. Um, so we'd have to start that on 11 to get it just to go countdown, lift off in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and so on. Anyhow, there is another way that you can do this part. So this is just to show you a few other ways. Rather than, if you go back, you can see here, we've written countdown timer is equal to the countdown timer of what it was before. I'm going to take one from it. A simpler way to write that is to write down countdown timer minus equals one. So this is minus equals is a special operator that says it's going to equal that, but take away whatever's on this side. So you can also do that with a plus and that would add one. And it's something you see a lot of uh, programmers use. And um, it's a handy little neat trick. But even better than that, um, in MQL4, you can also do this. You can also do countdown timer minus minus. And all that does is reduces the countdown timer by one. That's an automatic little trick you can do in your code. And if you see that, you know what people are doing. So that's really handy when you're doing something like this where you're reducing it by one. Or indeed, if you wanted to add one, you could do plus plus. Um, and that would do um, the opposite. It would add one every time this line of code is executed. So um, that's a really handy little trick and something you'll see if, see if you're looking at other people's code. So the next kind of loop we've got is a for loop. So we're going, to, we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to have our countdown timer, but this time we're going to use a for loop. Now, for loop is a little more complicated, but it shouldn't it shouldn't be too bad. We've got here for, so we've got the keyword here for, much like while. We're opening a bracket, and in this first section here, we've got the initialization section. So when the first time uh, this for loop is is run, it's going to do whatever you put in this first section. So in this case, it's going to create a variable called countdown timer is equal to 10. And this is the initialization. So it, it will be done before the very first loop. The second part of the, ex the second expression within the for loop code is, is the exit condition. So it's going to do this uh, while ever the countdown timer is greater than zero. So much like we did for the while, if this is true, it's going to do the code underneath. If it's false, it's going to jump outside. And then we've got our what it will do at the end of every loop. So we've got the start of the first loop, the end of every loop over here, countdown timer, and we're using that minus minus, and we're going to reduce countdown timer by one um, so that we get that nice um, countdown. So you can see this statement here is checked if it's true and if it is we'll execute the code and the last thing is done at the end of each code and in this case we're reducing it by one so we've got this almost the same in fact we don't need I've just realized we don't need this line here um, we can scratch that from there because it's already included in there so that's my bad um, we well it's almost exactly the same except the countdown time a bit does the reduction this uh, actually needs to go so excuse me but you've seen me correct it that's the nature of this sometimes but anyway um, and then uh, the rest of the code is pretty much the same so that's how the two um, loops work um, and then la the next thing we're going to go on to before we hit the meta editor is we're going to look at lists so we covered uh, the for loop before and generally the for loop is used in conjunction with lists so we need to know how lists or arrays work in um, in MQL4 so if you have um, a lot of variables um, of the same type, so if you've got you know, a list of uh, different prices, which would be doubles, or different numbers without decimal places, which would be integers or different bits of text, um, it can be very useful sometimes to save them in a list, um, which is an array um, in computer science speak. 
So um, I've got an example here of a list in MQL4. So we, like always, for a list, you have to declare the variable type that's going to be inside the list. So we do that with the string. Um, we've called it shopping list, and we've, we've told the computer that we want five slots. We want five spaces. Our list is going to be five items big. Um, so the computer knows how much memory to allocate to that list. We can then set the values, just, and it's just like how we set up a variable, and um, we set the values there. So we do, uh, here we open with the curly brackets, and then we've got five string variables here, which will go into the shopping list um, here. Um, so just to go over that again, we declare the variable type. You can't have mixed types, you can't have a mixture of numbers and uh, text, for instance, or integers and doubles. It's got to be the same type all the way through. You give it a name, much like you do for a normal variable, um, and then you give the values in the list in between the curly brackets. Now, um, if we were, so here we could um, put a bit of code that says we want to print, um, remember to buy, and we're going to say, remember to buy, and we, it's going to print that bit of text out, and then it's going to print out the zeroth value, if that makes sense to you or me, um, of the shopping list. Now, the one thing to remember um, with lists is that they are indexed, they start from zero. Now, normally when we count, we start with the number one, um, but you've got to remember in code, and this is universal to almost every programming language, you start on zero, and it's related to how binary works. So binary, um, you start with zero, one um, for your first two digits, um, and then you've got uh, zero, one again, and you don't want to waste um, any memory when you're writing, when you're doing binary. That's how um, the people that make computers thought of it. So they, they use that zero index. So you always start on zero. So if you put this in, um, uh, it would print, remember to buy eggs. So it's going to print the first one. So just remember that you've got to start at zero and then you go over there. The interesting thing about that is if you, if you remember, if you, um, the list is five numbers long, but if you put short shopping list um, five, it's going to give you an error called array out of range. And that's because you've tried to identify a number over here somewhere that doesn't exist. Um, so you've got to remember when you're doing the total or, or when you're identifying the last one, it's the total number of items in the list minus one because we start at zero. So again, that's something you might see that's a, a tad bit confusing with list. But once you get the hang of you starting at zero, um, you know, it'll all come together. So as an example here, we've got print, remember to buy. So um, I'll give you a second to think, which which of these um, five items is it going to say if we put shopping list number four? So the number four is the index of the list that we want. It's going to find the number four item um, in that list or the indexed item in there. So you remember you've got zero, one, two, three, four. So it's gonna say, remember to buy apples. So um, if you said orange juice, it's okay. You know, you just gotta get the hang off. It's, you're always starting at zero. So four, um, you've gotta start zero, one, two, three, four. And that's basically how this work. Now, you'll have seen this when you've seen me talk about, um, uh, it, when you talk about indicator values, when you get an indicator values, remember the current bar is the zeroth bar, and then we work back in time from there, zero, one, two, three, four, five. And again, that's where you see that zero there. So um, again, this is why it was important for me to bring in um, lists and arrays at this point. So you can see here how the indexes work for that list. There are some really useful predefined lists um, in MQL4 that you can call upon in your EA. So um, here are just some of them. There are actually more, but uh, you, you can find them in the documentation. But some key ones here, I thought I'd highlight because you've got here the open, the close, the high, the low, the time. Now the number you put in between the square brackets is going to be how many bars back um, from the current bar. So the zero bar is the, the bar that's being formed and then one, two, three, four, five, you know, bars back in time. So if that's an hourly bar and you put the number three, it's going to be the three hours back. If it's a daily uh, chart and you put the number three, it's going to be three days back. So it depends uh, what time frame you're on, um, but that will bring you the, the open, the close, the high and the low 
of the time frame. Now, all of these are for the current time frame, the current symbol that you've you've put the EA on. So that's worth remembering. Um, if you want a different time frame or different symbol, you need to use a function instead of these predefined variable lists. Um, and then you put the number of bars back in time you want in between the square brackets. So double, this is an example. We want the last high. Um, we create a double, last high, and then um, we'll get the first value back from where we are. So remember that zero bar is the one that's been currently formed. The number one is the one before it. So that would give us the one before's highest value on the current symbol and time frame. The zero bar is the current latest bar that's not fully formed and closed yet. Generally, you don't want to use that. You want to use at least the, the first bar back because as that bar is being formed, it's going up and down all the time. Um, you can end up getting lots of uh, false signals. So generally, we wait for that bar to close before we use it. Um, and so hence, we always we tend to always use number one. There may be some reason to use the current bar, but I would tend to steer clear of that. Be patient, let a bar close. Um, and you'll get a lot less um, false entries um, with your EA. Now, uh, I just thought I'd drop in here a little bit of a pro tip. These variables here uh, are all you need to do candlestick analysis. So I know a lot of you out there really, really like Japanese candlesticks and Japanese candlestick patterns. And if you really think about it, all they are is um, logic statements that compare the open the close the high and the low of each bar and the bar before and that kind of thing so um, as an example a doji candle um, would have the close and the open close to either the high or the low depending on the direction now you would have to figure out how you would check for that in um, in code languages using if statements and else statements but i'm i can tell you that that's all you need to analyze japanese candlestick patterns uh, that and some if statements and if that's all it takes that's all there is to it there's no magic to that kind of uh, technology you just compare open close high and low you the clever bit you've got to do is work out how to convey um, the shape of a Japanese candlestick in terms of if statements um, but it can be done so we're going to go over to the meta editor now and we're going to use one of those loops to make our close uh, our closing of our trades better than we had it before. So we are over here in the meta editor where we were before on lesson number eight, and we're now going to lesson number nine. So I'm going to do what I always do at the start of these lessons, uh, save it as a new file, just so I've got a track as I go along. So we've got our um, EA, our simple EA that uses the momentum indicator to buy or sell. Um, and it works pretty well and we have here um, you can see here we've got our order close function um, down here uh, we've also got our order close function and this is the built-in function but what we're going to do in this uh, lesson is we're going to actually make this a bit more robust and I'm going to show you a bit about that so we're going to make a um, function um, I'm not going to return any uh, variables here and I'm going to say I'm going to say close let's call it close uh, market order um, and in fact I'll take the market out and I'm just going to say close order so I'm going to call it close order and we're going to put in the ticket number um, so we need a integer um, and it's a so put p ticket for parameter ticket uh, we're going to we don't need the lot size we don't need that um, and then that's the slippage so that's all we need is a ticket number to close that order so we're now going to put the function in um, so what we want to do is we want to have here um, a we want to check if the trade context if um, if the terminal is busy because if the terminal is busy when we try to close the order it's not going to go through um, straight away so we can use a function called is trade context busy and I'm going to just highlight that 
and press the F1 button. And you can see returns information about the trade context. So returns true if a thread for trading is occupied by another expert advisor. So for instance, um, you know, if, you're, if you've got lots of EAs running, you could be trying to execute this trade at the same time as another one, which could mean the order isn't closed uh, when you want it to be, and that could be a problem. So what we're going to do here is we're going to put this inside a while loop. Um, and we'll use that function. And so that's going to return, if, if it is true, if it is true, if the, um, it is busy, we want to uh, wait. Um, so we can do our while loop there. So if it is if it's if it is busy and that returns true, we want to exit code code in here, um, which we're going to use the sleep, and we're going to sleep for um, let's say uh, 50 milliseconds uh, to give the uh, processor on our computer time to execute the trade we were doing before. So um, that's just something really really simple to make our uh, EA more robust, especially if we're running a lot of um, EAs on the same terminal. So we're going to check if the trade context is busy. We're then going to um, close our order. So we're going to um, we're going to. Um, but what we're going to do is when you use the order close, and you you see when I had the errors from uh, last time. In fact, if I run, uh, if I compile it. You can see the order close, it says the return value of the order close should be checked. So you can see here, order close actually returns a value, it's a boolean. Um, and if we um, get the help up again, you can see that it returns a boolean, which is whether or not basically um, the order close has worked and that order has been closed. So we want to make use of that because we, we want to know if our order has not been closed. So. We're going to create a variable on the fly uh, locally and we're going to say we're just going to call it closed um, and we're going to set that to be the value um, that comes out of the function of order close. So order close um, and then let's look at the variables that the function needs. So it needs the ticket number. So we've got the parameter that we've given um, and it also needs the, lot, the lots of uh, that order. Um, so we have to actually go and get those lots from the order. Um, so we're going now to, we're going to have to use another function, which is uh, we're going to have to select a ticket. We're going to have to select our ticket. So we're going to do order select. And we're going to use our ticket number here. And uh, we're going to use a select by ticket number in there. Um, it's worth checking out the um, the documentation if you are unfamiliar with this but take it from my word that this is an inbuilt function here that uh, if I show you the help for that in a moment let's see uh, let's, can you bring it up for me let's say close that there we go so the function selects an order for further process and so we get the index of it um, which is either where it is in a list but in this occasion, we're using a ticket number and we're going to um, choose uh, whether we choose by position or by ticket. In this case, we're using the ticket. So why I've used the select by ticket. Um, so I do that and that means that the terminal will load up that ticket for us to use. So now I can uh, I can use that and I can say create a variable called lots and I can set that to order lots so it will get the value of the orders lot so here if i show you on the again in the help returns the amount of lots on the selected order so we've selected uh this ticket um we've returned um the lots there so then we can put that into our subsequent function and here we need the price so here we need to know if um this is a uh because we're doing a market order, we need to know if this is uh, uh, the bid or the ask. So we need to find out um, if um, we're going to use another function. We're going to we're going to use something else to analyze our um, order that we've selected. So this is order type, and if the order type, uh, we're going to get the order type, um, and it will return op underscore 
buy. So you might have seen that. I think we use that further up here. Um, we use OP buy, OP sell. So if it's a buy function, um, we want to set a value, a variable of price. So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll create another one here. We'll call it price. Um, and we'll set if price, if order type is equal to buy. So if we're buying, um, then in order to get out of that order, we are selling our position. So if we're selling our position, we are going to have to pay the bid price. So the price is going to equal the bid price. Um, then we do the same if it's a sell. So we can do else if, um, if the order type is equal to a sell order, um, we can set the price to equal to the ask because it's the opposite. So now we've got a, a value for price, which is great um, that we can put into our function. Um, and we now need to set a slippage. Um, so as before, I just set it to 100 points and that is all we need to put in there. So um, we can now check, um, use a check function um, for this. Um, so if, and we're going to say if closed, is not equal is not equal to true we can create we can uh, use an alert so we'll do alert and we can say trade not closed and we can also put the ticket number in there so that the we can check that in the journal of the EA. So um, that's the basics of it. Now let's just compile that, see if I've got some errors. And I, you know, you always get some errors. So here, let's have a look. What have I done here? It says open parenthesis expected. Who? If, else if. Let's have a look. So I've selected the order. Yep. Uh, order lots, variable price, order type. Here we go. I've not made it into a function. There we go. So I forgot the open and close brackets there. Let's compile. Do I get that? Great. So that sort of works now. Now I need to include this in my main uh, there. So we're going to um, use it here. So Instead of order close, we're going to use our new function, which is close order. And we're simply going to put in our uh, ticket number so we can do G sell ticket. And that's it. So you can see how that's much simpler. And now we can take that out and we can do the same on the uh, on the opposite side and put our um, buy ticket in there. Because that our function is going to retrieve the lots of that ticket, um, it's going to work out whether we need the bid or ask automatically, and it's going to use our slippage in there. So that's going to make that easy. And if I compile that, you can see here it's got rid of a couple of our warnings. Um, but we have, um, but we have a, a, a warning here for order select. Now order select here um, again. Uh, returns a boolean um, because if we don't manage to select our order then a lot of these functions down here order type order lots they're not going to work because we've not managed to select an order properly so we could put this um, in inside an if statement so if uh, that function there works and then we put all of this within a uh, within that if statement like so so now it will only execute this trade here if this returns true, i.e. that this um, function here manages to select an appropriate ticket. So that gets rid of that warning. We have one here, which is possible use of uninitialized variable price. So what it's saying here is 
we potentially could use that. So because we've used an if and an else if price there, but we did initialize it there. Hmm. I set it to zero, will that make it better? There we go. So we've set it to zero. Um, that got rid of the warning because it's gonna have a default value in effect um, of zero. Now, the only way this wouldn't work is if we were using a pending order and these types um, wouldn't be recognized. So this really only does work for uh, market orders, but you can see where that goes. Now, I have deliberately not used another loop here, and I could, that's because I've got some homework for you that I really want you to take away. So we've used here an if statement to say if the um, closed function is true, and I'm actually gonna change that and make that a little bit neater. So if close is true, um, we can put a, uh, an exclamation mark here, which means not. So if it is not true, and we'll get that um, alert symbol. But what I want you to do here is I want you to take this uh, from this lesson, and I want you to see if you can work out how you would use a while loop to repeatedly check, to repeatedly execute this piece of code if closed um, returns uh, returns false. So rather than just doing it once and then alerting us, we want the EA to try and do this, let's say a maximum of five times. So how would you do that um, using a while loop? That's the homework for this lesson. Um, Rewatch the video if you have to on while, check out the documentation. Um, you can do that if you go into your, um, to, uh, if you go to editor here, press F1, excuse me, not function F1 on my keyboard, but just F1. Um, you can see it'll bring up the documentation, the while, and it will tell you how that goes in the detail, more detail than I have in this presentation. But how could you use that while loop to redo the execution of this code um, until that order is closed, or you've had at least five goes at closing that order? If you've had more than five goes and it doesn't work, then maybe something else is wrong and you don't want to get it stuck in an infinite loop. But let's say you want it to try five times using a while loop. How would you do that? So there you go. That's how we've used a list um, and a while loop in our EA to, uh, to close our trades in a better way. Um, I hope you found that useful. Um, if you have any questions, of course, you can ask me. In the next video, um, we're going to be covering risk management. So we're going to look at how we manage the risk with our EA and uh, vary that um, depending on what we want to do with it. So we'll look at um, using inputs to set a fixed stop loss. We're going to uh, look at using the average true range indicator to create a volatility based stop. And then we'll look at setting our uh, EA to have a risk per trade, a percent of our account balance per trade based on uh, the ATR value. So if you want to see that, make sure you come and watch the video next time. If you have any questions, drop it in the comment section below. I'll answer as many as I can, or you can come across to the Toolkit for Traders forum where there's hundreds of people like you who are on the journey together, learning to code and helping each other out. Uh, this Thursday, 25th of February, I'm going to code the third EA for the channel, uh, which is going to be done live. I'm going to use the framework that we've, we've been, um, been working with on this um, YouTube series as the base for, uh, for another EA which um, based on some feedback I have, I'm going to base on the Bollinger Bands, some candlestick uh, patterns, Japanese candlestick patterns, and using a simple moving average as a filter. So if you want to see that, make sure you hit the subscribe button and uh, join for the next, uh, so you get updated when the next video comes out. And if you like the video as always, make sure you give it a like and a subscribe. It really helps me get the, the name of the channel out there so more and more people can can um, see what I'm about and and if you found this useful I'm sure you would like other people to know that there's free stuff out there that's really really good and you don't have to pay thousands of dollars um, to get good content um, but other than that thanks for watching the video and keep well <laughs>